Well, good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Energy, sorry, the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, first of all, I would ask all those in the public gallery to turn off their electrical devices or any that might interfere with the systems. Item one in the, dis the, the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Is the committee agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, this morning, item two in the agenda is the Registers of Scotland, and I welcome this morning Jennifer Henderson, Keeper of the Registers of Scotland, and Janet Egdell, who is Operations Director and Accountable Officer from the Registers of Scotland. So we'll turn now to questions from committee members, and I'll start first of all with Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder whether I could explore with you your status and your accountability. Um, I understand you're a non-ministerial department. Um, could you tell us what that means in, in practical terms and also explain who you're accountable to? Um, so we're accountable to Parliament. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, and so obviously events like today are part of that accountability. Um, our non-ministerial status means that we are not subject to the direction of ministers for the day-to-day -day operations of what we do. So ministers are not directly involved in any of the decisions that I make around registering people's property. Um, our framework document uh, sets out a number of roles that ministers do play in relation to bringing forward Scottish statutory instruments, I can never say that, um, to put in place various regulations around our fees and things like that and, and the legislation within which we operate. But once that's in place, the day-to-day -day operation isn't subject to ministerial direction. A, a non-ministerial body is quite unusual. I mean, how many are there in Scotland? Are you aware of how many? I don't know exactly how many there are in Scotland. There are a few um, and they all, the ones that there are, have, have a similar um, s arrangement to us in that they're making decisions where... I think it would be inappropriate for ministers to have direct involvement in those decisions. Okay. Um, yet the separation of policy, so ministers are responsible for policy, you're re responsible for day-to-day -day operation. Surely the two should be combined rather than being separate. Are there any issues that, that you think have been problems because they haven't been combined? I don't think so. I mean, I think the independence that we have, so for example, one of the things we deal with quite a bit is people corresponding with us about the registration of their property, about exactly where their boundaries are. I think it's appropriate that ministers are not directly involved in those decisions and that I am making those decisions, looking at the legal basis that people are writing to me on, looking at what the law says and making that decision in accordance with the legislation that's in operation, and not subject to any kind of other influences in relation to that. I mean, clearly as an organisation, we support the delivery of policy objectives. Obviously, our big thing at the moment, completing the land register, is something we're working towards. But the actual practicalities of how we're doing that is something that's within our gift to determine. OK, but surely having policy alignment with how you actually implement something is a good thing because you ensure that the policy actually happens. How do you ensure that alignment happens if ministers aren't jointly accountable for both areas? Well, we, so if I, I'll use land register completion as an example. Um, we keep ministers informed of the progress we're making. Uh, we would raise any issues that we were experiencing. If we felt that any kind of legislative input was needed in order to support the delivery of a policy, clearly we would raise that to ministers. But the actual day-to-day -day operation of making sure we are delivering the policy is something that I don't think we have any problem with moving forward on a day-to-day -day basis on our own. Okay. Let me turn to accountability because you may be aware that um, some of your colleagues at a UK level um, have been criticised as being part of, of uh, non-ministerial departments and their lack of accountability to Parliament in practice. Um, so I want to explore with you um, how you've been accountable to this Parliament. And I have to confess, this is the first time I've seen you appear at a committee and this is... If you would like a sponsor committee, this is it. Um, so I'm unclear how you ensure that accountability happens. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here today. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively new in the role. I've been keeper since April last year. I would happily come to committee as often as I'm invited. Um, we do have input into other committees. I appeared in front of the ECLA committee at the end of last year around the uh, regulations that are being brought in to do the Register of Controlling Interests. 
Um, I think outside of formal events like this, clearly accountability to individual members of the Scottish Parliament. We deal with a large amount of correspondence through my office where MSPs can clearly write to us if anything's being raised with their constituents. Um, we obviously answer parliamentary questions as and when they're arisen. Um, and I'd be happy to do more. I mean, it's one of the things since coming into the role, I've been very keen to make sure that what my organisation is doing is being held to account. We have been, I think, I think if I may say, I think broader accountability to the Scottish public and to the customers is something I've been pushing forward, making sure that the people who use our services are able to challenge us on whether we are doing it well enough and are we are answerable for anything that's not going as well as it should be doing. So I'm happy to do as much as we're invited to do. How, how do you do that? Because um, obviously lawyers, I would suspect, are the people that, that use your services the most. Um, how do you ensure that you're accountable to them? And if they were to give you a score out of 10, what do you think they'd give you? Well, we do. I can tell you exactly what they'd give us because we do a customer satisfaction survey. Um, so our customer satisfaction is currently at 62% in the questionnaire that goes out, asks people, you know, for how satisfied they are with various aspects of our service. Um, we have service standards and we publish regularly how we're performing against those in relation to the various services we offer. I also, on a more informal basis, do a monthly newsletter out to anyone who's signed up to it. So we have about 20,000 recipients of that, so not just solicitors, but also members of the public, which gives an update on how various things we've been working on are coming in. And then I've also just completed a three-month tour around Scotland to make sure that actually we're getting out and talking to our customers wherever they are, rather than in terms of that face-to-face -face contact, relying on them having the means to come and see us here in Edinburgh or in our offices in Glasgow. We also deal with an awful lot of correspondence directly with our customers. So I run a customer services centre. They get many, many phone calls and letters every day with people asking for updates on various individual cases. Um, so all of that adds up to, I think, a very transparent approach around how we're performing as a business and ans answering any questions about the degree to which we're providing the service our customers expect. Um, one final thing, convener, and uh, I'll allow other members of the committee in to develop particular detail. Um, you reference letters and PQs from MSPs as part of that you know, uh, accountability piece. Um, I wonder, perhaps you don't have the information here, but you could provide it to us, um, how many letters you receive from MSPs in a year, um, how many PQs, probably aside from my colleagues sitting to my right, you get asked in any given year um, because, by your account, you've attended one committee in a year. OK, that information would be helpful to have, convener. Um, I can provide the absolute detail, if you don't mind, offline. But, I mean, typically we're responding to between one and five pieces of MSP correspondence each week. It just depends, I think, on the week. And I think in the last year since I've been in, we've probably dealt with about 10 PQs, but I would want to go back and provide the exact detail, if I may. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you. Yes, please do. And if you could also, the, the customer satisfaction rating of 62%, is that of all customers or of those who respond? If so, what percentage actually respond to the survey in terms of customer satisfaction? If you could provide us with the detail of the, where that figure comes from as uh, well, please. I can certainly provide more detail. I mean, that's uh, 400 customers. That That's the sample that we've used to come up with that number. Um, but we can certainly provide more detail on how that number is to come up with how many people we've actually asked for the input versus how many responded. Again, I'd like to take that offline, if I may. Uh, and also the percentage that is of the total yes. um, customer base. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, and thank you for coming this, this morning. Just following up Jackie's question about accountability, I'm interested in the, um, the fact that Scottish ministers um, set a target to complete the land register for public land in 2019, and by 24 for, for the rest. Um, your framework document sets out the, in paragraph 15, uh, your framework document of July 2018, sets out the role of Scottish ministers um, to prescribe by SSIs, to make SSIs to... Uh, with the consent of the Lord President, appoint yourself, etc. But nowhere, and, and you said, I think, in your opening remarks, ministers do not direct us. So what, under what authority do ministers require you to complete the land register by 2019 for public land and 2024 for 
everything else? So there's been no legislation around that. I mean, I think part, part of what we're doing anyway is moving towards completing the land register. I'm a firm believer that a target is a good thing. It incentivises okay. everyone involved to pull out all the stops, to try and make something happen in the most realistic time frame possible. But that direction, which obviously predates me, is not something that there's been legislation for. Um, and we're working as hard as we can to meet that target. I think one observation I'd like to make about the target is it's clearly not completely within Registers of Scotland gift. The completion of the land register requires lots of organisations to submit information to us. Ministers don't have ability in most cases to direct those organisations either. So it is a sort of collective effort to work towards meeting that target. We're doing everything we can to fulfil are part of that. It suits us as an organisation to reach a point where we have a complete land register. It will allow us to change some of our operations in terms of the types of cases we're handling. So it's in our interest to try and get there as quickly as possible. So it's fairly helpful to us that ministers set out that aspiration and it's given us the licence to go out and have some conversations with organisations, particularly around voluntary registration, which obviously something was something that wasn't really happening in any great scale prior to that target being set to go and have conversations with some of the large landowners about the voluntary registration process and encourage them to accelerate coming on to the land register and again I think for a number of those landowners that's been something they've been very willing to do it suits them to get their land registered out of the Sazine register and onto the land register so I think for all parties involved it's been quite helpful to have a goal rather than something that was just rumbling on and taking its time. Okay, I think goals are useful. It's worth noting during the passage of the Land Registration Act in 2012 uh, that the government, uh, Fergus Ewing, as I recall, in front of this committee's predecessor, um, uh, rejected amendments to set targets in, in primary legislation. Um, the, 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 the target to, to register all publicly land is to be complete by 2019. So, as you're aware, this is 2019. Um, the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recently wrote to all of Scotland's public authorities, or a large number of them, to ask how they were getting on. Um, the City of Edinburgh Council said it's not likely um, that it will be completed by 2019. Uh, they say the Council has neither the resources nor the budget to accomplish the task in the envisaged timescale. And they also say the Council understands that all other local authorities in Scotland would be faced with a similar task, scale of task to complete registration of the land by 2019. Uh, Stirling Council uh, say that um, the Council will not complete the registration by 2019. Uh, Aberdeen City Council say it's not able to do it, we have no resources available, uh, etc. It says that a meeting was held with yourself, the Registrars of Scotland's voluntary registration team, Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, Murray and Angus on the 8th of December 2016. Um, similar concerns were raised in 2016. So the bottom line is there's no way Councils are going to meet this target. They haven't met this target. So what correspondence was had with the government in 2016 uh, about the failure to meet this target and who is accountable for that failure? Um, so perhaps it would be useful if I gave an update on where we are with the 2019 target. I mean, I think you rightly identify something that we've known ever since the target was set, which is that the parties involved, you know, the people who own the land and us have to come together to fulfill the registration process it's not something we can unilaterally do so we've been working hard with all the public bodies to support them to do two things um, the voluntary registration piece you call out which is where uh, an owner of land would need to provide us with a bunch of information and pay for the registration to happen and then uh, one of the things that came in obviously you'll be aware in the 2012 act was keeper induced registration where if the body provides me with the information i can undertake the registration without charging a fee for that but it still requires the body to provide information. So with a number of the public bodies, we're being very successful in them providing information to support keeper-induced registration. So particularly public bodies who own housing association properties, that's supporting us getting a large number of titles onto the land register. The challenge, I think, for some of the public bodies is where they own large areas of land that they would need to provide us with all the information and voluntary register. As you rightly call out, they're saying they haven't got the resources. 
It's not true of every local authority. Some local authorities are able to do what's needed within the time scale. Um, we've been uh, through regular updates to ministers providing an update um, on how that land register completion is progressing um, and not just the public stuff but also the private stuff, how we're getting on there. I think we're thinking now how else we can support local authorities who don't have the resources. Um, we've also been focusing on the public bodies who own the biggest areas of land in terms of land mass coverage. So I would single out as a particularly excellent organisation we've been working with, the Forestry Commission, who are absolutely going to hit the 2019 target. They're going to get all the land they own registered with us, but we are going to have to work slightly more slowly through the public bodies who haven't had the resources to do the work that they need to do to hit the target. So has any local authority intimated that they will hit the target? Uh, I believe yes, and off the top of my head, I can't recall which ones are going to have finished the job this year, but some of them will have done. And, I mean, Highland Council are saying a Conservative estimate would be £8.5 million to do it. What, what assessment was made in 2014 of the feasibility of achieving this target and what the pathways would be? I appreciate you weren't in post then, but it'd be useful if there was any correspondence or any evaluation you made, uh, because this cuts to the heart of the question of accountability. Um, you are a self-funding organisation and therefore it would be interesting to know what assessment you made of the request that was being made by Scottish ministers, um, which you acceded to and didn't, didn't in any way kick back on. So I think I would respond, um, and, and Janet will potentially be able to pick up because um, she's obviously been in post longer than me. So there are very much two parts to the registration process for completing the land register. There's the work that the body owning the land needs to do, which involves quite a large amount of legal work in order to pull together all their deeds, make sure they've got an accurate plan of what they own and provide that information to us for registration. We are completely comfortable internally within Registers of Scotland that we have the relevant amount of resource to register all the land if it comes to us over the next five-year period. We are absolutely resourced to do that if we need to. We've been working on ways of automating some of those processes so it's not such a manpower-intensive piece. And the assessments that were done at the time when the target was set was, yes, it would be a big effort, but we could do the job that was required of us. That is why it's particularly important to emphasise around the voluntary registration piece. You know, we cannot afford to do keeper-induced registration for everything for free because clearly I have to pay staff to be there doing the work. So we can do a certain amount of keeper-induced registration where we can put a large number of titles on in one go for relatively little amounts of effort from my staff. But for the big, complex pieces of land, it's a very manpower-intensive process for me and therefore I need to be funded to do it. Um, so we were comfortable internally that we could do the job. I'm not cited on what correspondence was has with all the public bodies um, who were going to have to do their part of the bargain and therefore what was said at the time about how much they felt or not it was possible to do that. But all I can say is from Registers of Scotland point of view, we've been pulling out all the stops to do everything we can do to move as fast towards the target. And I'd also say, I mean, we're making some very encouraging progress. So currently in the building at the moment, what we are working on is another 16% of land mass. So if we can get that completed in the near future, that will be a significant step forward in terms of the land mass coverage of Scotland. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say around that is we're also thinking about one of the challenges that the... Um, owners of property have is not only do they have to get the map of what they own but they then have to get all the legal deeds to sort of back up their ownership clearly around making policy decisions around land ownership and potential land reform the map is the most useful thing and so we're working to pull together what we're going to call a pre-registration layer so when bodies have got their maps together they send them in so we'll build it build up that map of Scotland with to a reasonable degree of certainty who owns everything it'll obviously need to progress to registration to actually get to the point of being able to say yes the boundary is exactly there but we feel that that interim step will be quite a useful step for some of the decisions that we know a complete land register is intended to support. So you're saying that you you were comfortable that you could do your bit of the bargain? Yes. Um, I mean, it sounds like there was no consultation at all with the public bodies, some of whom own land. I mean, Perth 
is 800 years old. It's a lot of land that's not even on the register of Sassians. They're, la they're not even Latin deeds that they're lost. They're lost. Um, okay, thanks. I have a few more questions, but I'll come back later. Um, Tom Mason. Yes, I mean, really um, welcome. Um, I want to extend your conversation in the terms of alternative methods of, of land access and, and, and view, um, taking a much more um, scientific approach with um, aerial phot photography and so on. I mean, how far are you progressing on that? And how, well, it won't, may, may not be legal in the end of the day. Is, is, how, is that part of your interim process, or is it, so, do you need to go further than the, the general's perspective? And you actually go into legal detail. So we've introduced aerial photography recently as one of the layers on our Scott List system because that's something that people have said is useful when they're trying to understand aspects of where boundaries sit and things like that. I mean, I think it's important to emphasise that the legal basis on which someone can assert that they own a piece of land is when it is on the land register, also on the Sazian register, but clearly we're transferring that across, and that actually the boundaries have to be mapped to the degree of accuracy of the underlying ordnance survey map. So the actual legal basis on which people will be able to transact on land will always be about absolutely completing their title on the land register. But I think we fully recognise within Registers of Scotland that to support some of the wider debate around land ownership and land reform, you could have a more aggregate level view of what people own and what concentration of land there is and things like that to inform some of those decisions. And it doesn't need to be at the level of accuracy that the actual registration would give you. But I'm not sure that answers your question. Well, it just, I mean, in any, it's unlikely you're ever going to achieve 100% registration, I, I would suggest. In, in the end of the day, I mean, that's an impossible task because there will always be some wall or, or bit of land which is not there. And most of the problems are, in fact, not in the, ma the, the land mass itself, but in the, the detail around the edges, um, fights over who owns what and so on. I mean, it w will, in fact, at the end of the day, the, the alternative methods of view viewing the land contribute to or solving that? Or do, is it always going to be down to the legal detail and physical measure if you like. I, well I think I mean again in terms of correspondence that comes through my office the biggest correspondence we see from MSPs and others is sort of helping neighbours sort out boundary disputes and that is always going to come down to the legal detail about exactly where someone's boundary sits and you know are people satisfied that their fence is in the place that actually the boundary is and there's I don't think there's anything we can do to get away with that. I think the alternative ways of viewing land ownership in Scotland will allow us to see something about concentration of land ownership, how much land in particular area is owned by what type of body. But if you're ever going to get down to the boundaries, it's going to be about the specific legal registration. Um, and that's something we're going to continue to need to do so that people can transact safely on their land. But in terms of the overall target, as I say, I don't think you're ever going to get to 100%. What, what figure do you, would, would you be satisfied to getting to within the time scale you've been allowed? Is it? I, think, I think, I mean, we use a phrase called functional completion. So you are right, you are going to end up with a situation where, I mean, they take a very simple example. Someone registers the land they own, we draw the map. Someone registers the neighbouring property, we draw the map. If those two maps parts don't exactly join up, there's a little slither of land in the middle, which it's not clear who owns that. Um, some very learned lawyers are currently debating what's going to be the best way to deal with all those little parts of the map once we know where they all are. But I mean, we'll get to the high 90s. I mean, subject to uh, Mr. Whiteman's sort of questions about the ability of bodies to provide us the information, we'll get to the high 90s in terms of what people can absolutely assert they own and provide us with the relevant deeds. It'll just be all those little bits of land that over the years it's been lost who is the owner of those, that there'll need to be a decision about what needs to happen in terms of getting those registered and something so that people can use them appropriately. When you say high 90s, 98%? I think so. OK, commit to that? I commit to that from the point of view of subject to people providing us with the information we need. I, I mean, I can, I, can, I can tell you why I have that level of confidence. So 
we have internally a sort of target set that says every single month what landmass do we need to be adding to the register and what number of titles do we need to be adding to the register and if you draw the line out to the end of 2024 currently we are on that target so at the moment we're getting the volume of business coming in that actually allows us to work through the work get things on the land register but I think as I say in response to Mr Whiteman's question it relies on people continuing to be able to flow that information to us and we work very hard our voluntary registration team work extremely hard to get out and keep that work coming but we can't predict that we won't run to the point where people start saying I'm not interested in participating in this process I'm not going to send you the information and we at that point won't be able to register their land what we will be able to do at that point is as I've described this pre-registration layer say well, we think we know who owns that land. The fact that they haven't been able to provide us with the deeds and they're not interested in participating in voluntary registration, we could mark on a pre-registration layer that we provisionally expect eventually that land will end up being registered to X, and that, I think, will be a helpful thing to be able to provide. So the register of Saysings would remain as a, for the 2%, or would you hope that some decision would be taken about these other bits of land so that that could be closed and it would all be on the land register or what's your my ambition will be so my ambition will be to reach a point where we can close the register of saisins i think every register we have clearly costs us time money and effort to keep open so not being able to fully close the register of saisins would be a good thing so i think it will be something we need to work on over the next few years to agree what will be the position for all those little parts of land that are not registered on the land register by 2024 and but that will be a, a law position it would be something that the law society of scotland and people like that would need to be involved in discussing well what might be and the law commission what might be the appropriate way of legally dealing with that if there is no legal solution we'll keep the register of saising open for as long as it needs to be kept open while there is legally registered land in it Thank you. Andy Whiteman, did you have another question? Yes, just back to another sort of policy initiative, and this is the, the, the Scotless project, um, which I think was first talked about in the 1990s. And this relates again to questions of you know, accountability and direction, etc. So John Swinney um, asked you in July 25 um, to create um, what was called Scotless Scottish Land Information Service, uh, and I quote the purpose of Scotless is to enable users to access quickly and easily information about any piece of land or property in Scotland through a single online inquiry. And the, the terms of reference that were set at the time by the Registers of Scotland aimed to get the first wave data sets in place by October 2017. So for a solicitor, for example, this would include Registers of Scotland's own data on inhibitions and land register, uh, planning, uh, contaminated land, drainage, listed buildings, information from companies, house, our public rights of way, utilities, energy performance, etc. And for the public, it included school catchment areas, local health care, council tax bans, planning consents, etc. Um, by 2017, you had published something, and I have a, I'm looking at it now, and it doesn't do any of these things apart from your own data. So again, um, why was that not complete by 2017, and who's really accountable and in charge of taking that further forward? Um, so, I, will, I mean, I guess I'll set out what we've been seeking to achieve with Scotless. So, the purpose of Scotless is two purposes, as far as I'm concerned. The first one is to support solicitors in fulfilling their conveyancing role. Um, we were operating an old system within Registers of Scotland called Registers Direct, which had been in place for quite a long time, and that fundamentally enabled solicitors to access the most fundamental thing they need in the conveyancing process, which is the title information. So our first priority when we launched Scotless was to get the title information moved across. Um, we are working, and we've worked in the last year, we then spoke to solicitors and said, well, what do you want next? And they said, well, the next thing we want is all your other registers. So that's been the progress since we launched Scotless in October 2017 to add all of our other registers in. I think it's really important to emphasise with Scotless that it's a system that's constantly evolving. So the feedback that solicitors can provide 
and we are constantly, like every week, there are multiple updates, subtle updates to the system where solicitors get hold of us through the feedback form and they go, oh, it'd be great if we could zoom on the map in this way or it'd be great if I could pull the information off in this way. So we've very much been user-led in the last year in how we've developed the system to say to solicitors, we'll do what you need in order to make it useful to you. The other half of where we're trying to go with the system is around the citizen, because I think it's extremely important that we think about how our information is available to the citizen. And again, we want to be user-led, so we've been running citizen workshops to understand with citizens what would they like Scotlist to be. And in the coming couple of months, we're going to be rolling out a new citizen version of Scotlist that responds to their requests about what kind of information do they want to access and how might we build up those information layers. I think dealing with your question about other types of information, we have been looking at that. So, for example, we looked at the coal authority to say, how could we pull coal authority data into Scotlist? We've encountered some challenges around the resolution of the coal authority data and how it does or doesn't fit with Scotlist. And actually, we've chosen at the moment to say it's not the priority to get that information on. We'd rather keep on working to respond to what solicitors and now the citizen need in terms of giving them something that's most useful to them. I've definitely got aspirations to keep building layers onto Scotless, but I don't see any point in putting stuff on there when there isn't yet a user need defined to do it. The user need was defined in the, um, in the first wave data in the terms of reference. And this, this was stimulated by, as I understand it, the experience in Norway of their land information portal. Um, I think Norway is um, number five in the in the World Bank's um, doing business uh, ranking. Uh, the UK is 42nd. Uh, Georgia is number four. Armenia is 14. Moldova is 22. Um, you know, I'm online looking at 150 uh, different bits of information in the state of Montana, in the US. I mean, my understanding was that Scotland was to be a a portal to provide the kind of data that we're talking about here, uh, rights of way, utilities, planning, etc. So I'm just seeking to understand, okay, this hasn't been achieved by the target date again, but why is Registers of Scotland in charge of this? Because um, you speak, you're talking about almost as if you're just speaking to solicitors. Um, I mean, I have constituents who want to find out who owns flats in their tenement because they're short-term lets and they're having problems. I mean, not only does it cost them £30, so that's £180, and they can't afford it. Uh, but they want to find all sorts of other information about, for example, does it have planning consent as a short-term let? Um, are they paying um, non-domestic rates? And so the idea of Scotland, as I understood it, was a one-stop shop where you could go and find that information. Mm -hmm. That strikes me is that it should be a system whose development is governed by a broad board across the public sector, including the Scottish Assessor, COSLA, uh, Scottish <coughs> Water, uh, and various others. I mean, you're implying that basically you, you're running this and you will develop it according to what you perceive your customers want. Is that correct? Or is there a, a broader <coughs> board that's taking some kind of governance role about developing it? Uh, so it's not a broader board. I mean, we are developing it and we are funding the development of it. I would be delighted if other organisations wanted to co-fund it with us, but at the moment it's something that only Registers of Scotland is putting money into. Um, I'll just pick up, if I may, on your point about the citizen. I 100% agree that we want to build a, syst a system that gives the citizen useful information. One of the things that we're going to be able to do very soon, I hope within the next quarter, is enable the citizen to download their title sheet through Scotlist for the same £3 charge that a solicitor currently pays. So I think that will improve things for um, people being able to find out that information about who owns the properties around them for a much lower cost than at the moment. We can only offer a service where they have to call up our customer services centre or come into the offices in person. That then incurs time and effort from my staff to go and find that information, which is why there's currently a higher charge charge. So I think that will be good progress to be able to offer the citizen the same price as a business user would currently offer. But then I think the citizen panels that we're currently running are about understanding what else does the citizen need. One of the pieces of feedback we've had, which 
I know it was also picked up in the um, Towards Transparency in Land Ownership report by Community Land Scotland, was about the challenge of the average citizen understanding the very legalistic information that's provided with the title certificate. So we've been working with a citizen panel to think about how can we provide an appropriate explanation so that when a citizen pays the £3 and downloads the title sheet that's looking at their neighbour's property, they actually can understand what it's telling them without hopefully having to go and consider a lawyer and again for me that's a greater priority than adding in other layers of information I'd rather get some of the basics in place first and I'd certainly be as I say I'd be delighted if other organizations wanted to come in and co-fund but that hasn't been something that people have been showing an interest in to date so we're working as hard as we can within what we can do to move the system forward so that gets to the heart of my question which is you know who is governing this um, and you say no one else wants to come in, but that's presumably because no one realises that they could uh, come in um, if they want. I mean, as things stand, the project is complete as far as John Swinney was concerned in the Scottish Government, but there doesn't seem to be any um, lead in taking it any further forward. I mean, you mentioned the, the citizen being able to pay £3. I mean, it's always been a curiosity to me that solicitors and, and people with, with money get it for tenth of the price of the ordinary citizen. Um, and I mean, Denmark, for example, has developed a, a free to use model um, and evaluated the economic impact assessment of that as being worth 800 million pounds to the economy um, as a compared to a, a pay to use model at the moment. I mean, you mentioned you're intending to roll this out so that the citizen can access, you said at the beginning, their own title, but then you talked about titles around them. So any title. Any title. Yeah, in this, in this, I mean, we're a public register, so a, a citizen... So you would need, you'd need a f new fee order for that? Uh, no, we wouldn't need a new fee order. Um, Scotless, the fees we charge for Scotless are not subject to our fee order. The fee order prescribes the cost of people accessing our information via phoning our customer services or coming in in person. I think it's good news that by building out a digital system, we're able to provide it at a much lower cost than that. So we wouldn't need a new fee order for that. My understanding is you need a fee order. I mean, I, years ago, I was accessing information for free on the basis of a research, research needs. Um, Audit Scotland told you that you had no legal authority to provide free access because you could only provide access based on what was in the fee order. So I'm a little bit surprised you're saying that you can make up the rules for Scotless out with the fee order? Because Scotless is not a statutory service, so f the fee order applies to the statutory services but we provide. But once you get in through Scotless, you're getting to land register titles. That's correct. So at that point, the fee order surely governs the price being paid. It, it doesn't because it, the, the fee order covers us. The, our mandatory requirement, our statutory requirement is to provide access to the register to, uh, through a customer services centre or people coming in in person. We are, I think, in, in a good position of being able to provide an alternative way of doing that and do that in a way that's a more economic for the user, but that is not a statutory service. Scotless is not a statutory service. You could make that free if you wished. In theory, we could make it free. In practice, that would not be practical for us because building and developing Scotless is, co is costing us a substantial amount of money. And therefore, in order to fund that service, to keep that service up to date, we have to charge a price for the information so access. So you're saying Scotless service. is costing you a lot of money. It was government that wanted you to do that. Wh who's accountable for spending all that money developing a system that wasn't at your initiative, it was at government's initiative. And as I understand it, government put no money into this. The government has put no money into this. We are self-funding it, which is why we're recovering our costs by charging for the information that's provided. I think it's also worth saying we do provide a certain amount of information that is free for our Scott list, so people can access some of the information for free, but we are charging for people to access the title sheet. I mean, Janet is obviously in charge of all the sort of finance side of things, so I'm sure could go into that in a lot more detail offline if it's something you want to explore with us more. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to have a little look at uh, digital services and maybe starting looking at the historical side. Um, Back in 2011-12, uh, I was serving at that time on the public, then public audit committee, and there was a tremendous problem with your IT. 
uh, and the BT contract that went with that. What lessons have you learned from that that you're implementing now? Uh, so we are no longer with BT, I'm sure, as I'm sure you're aware. We are um, doing our digital services as an in-house thing at the moment, which I think gives us much more control over being more dynamic in responding. I mean, I think we've got a big program of digital activity working forward at the moment. There's a sort of externally facing piece around the provision of digital services to our customers. There's an awful lot of internal work we're doing around enhancing our internal tooling digitally. And then we're doing some absolutely fantastic work around the kind of resilience of our services, kind of making sure we've got good disaster recovery. You know, we can't, we're a 24 seven operation in terms of making sure that our services are up and running for anyone wants, that wants to use them at any point of the day or night and making sure that we can recover if there's a power outage instantly is a big priority for us at the moment so i think the lessons we've learned are about how we specify what we need to make sure that we've got controlling it effectively again janet from a sort of accountability officer point of view could pick up on that yes i mean, I mean in a way um i, th I think what we've done we've we, yeah we've learned uh, that uh, we need to resource in quite a different way for, for digital and we've tried lots of different um, uh, mix of resources. What we'd love is to have people on our payroll who are um, digital experts. We can't get enough of those at, um, at civil service pay rates and so we've always had a bit of a mix of, um, of resource coming from contractors from some companies where we've got bespoke pieces of work that we can um, we, we can uh, give to a particular company to do um, and and in-house but absolutely that lesson we learnt that outsourcing all of our um, our intelligent client uh, capability didn't work for us um, under the under a long-term contract so we brought that in I think what we've really learnt is to be just a lot more flexible over the last few years so we've done a lot of um, transformation in different ways and some of it's about the tech but a lot of it's about getting the tech ready with the processes with the people and it's that mix that actually delivers for us so we've put a lot of effort into that I just um, picking up on the kind of Scott list, how we've developed it, and it is different from what we originally put in the original business case. And I think that kind of that has worked from from my point of view, with my accountability hat on. And um, you know, to get value for money, we need to keep listening and not think that our original idea is always was right. We actually, with Scott list, was a really good example of then when we went out to more users, we got quite different feedback, and so we've taken it a bit more slowly. And we've done something similar recently with our digital securities service. We've, we've got a really good digital discharge service in place now that has, is working um, very fast between lenders and solicitors and ourselves, um, where we used to have um, uh, deeds floating by post and it would take several weeks to get something discharged. Now you can do it within minutes and everybody can get on the same online system. So that's worked much more effectively for us. And, and we thought we would go on from that to develop a digital security service. Uh, and we've talked to the lenders and we've talked to the um, solicitors who would be using it and um, they're not ready for it. They're not ready for the signature, digital signatures that would sit behind that. They're not ready to, to actually take that. It's, for them, it's a it's a level of risk that they're not ready for. And so rather than just push ahead with that, we've kind of learnt, I, th I think over these last few years, we've learnt to really listen to that and go, OK, we, sometimes we need to slow down or stop and actually um, yeah, take our users with us. So I take it that uh, having brought everything in-house, all your development is now in-house, all the systems that you're developing is done by your own staff or contractors? Yes, um, and, and occasionally we use uh, um, we use some professional service companies as well, where we can where it's a discrete piece of work. Um, but but mostly we're using contractors, and we're trying to use our contractors also to kind of buddy up with some of our in um, in house people, and so we're kind of growing growing our own um, through that process as well. But if uh, if you're doing everything in house, obviously you're a bit isolated in what you're doing. How do you, I mean, there must be systems off the shelf that you can bring in house and adapt to your own needs. Surely you're not developing everything from scratch. 
yes, you're quite right. I, I don't mean we're, we're not buying off the shelf um, services, but the configuration in house. So, so we've, for example, um, put in place a case management system that we're using so we can use digital case bags go um, around the business rather than um, physical paper, paper um, case bags. Uh, and and that is an off-the-shelf um, off-the-shelf system that we have just the the work for us has been adapting it to our own um, our own needs. Now, you've touched on the fact that it's quite difficult to get uh, IT specialists, and that's that's been so across the whole of the public sector. Um, do you offer any incentives to be able to attract these people in? I can speak to that. I mean, I think one of our aspirations as an organisation is to make ourselves an employer of choice, where if someone is thinking about a career in the civil service, Registers of Scotland is somewhere they want to come and work. The feedback we've had from some of our in-house digital folks is the work we're doing is exciting. It's exciting to be big building the kind of digital services we're offering. We're innovating in the way we do it. There's a lot of customer contact. So, And I think, therefore, we're an attractive place for people to come and work. We don't offer any other incentives in terms of you know civil service terms and conditions are standard so we think the thing we need to make sure we do is that people want to come and work for us because the work is going to really develop them and give them new skills and give them the opportunity to do something that they wouldn't otherwise get a chance to do elsewhere in the civil service i think the other thing that i find very comforting that our people say to us is there's a public service ethos you know people want to come and work for us because they feel the job we do matters it makes a difference to the country and that that's an incentive for them to come and apply their skills in-house with us rather than out and about in the wider private sector. Now, in the light of difficulties elsewhere with uh, IT projects, the Scottish Government set up a unit, and I can't remember the official name for it, but basically to provide the skills, project management skills, that uh, you know, individual departments and so on perhaps don't have internally. Do you make use of that service or do you work separately from that? Uh, so we work regularly. I mean, the digital director, I have a regular catch up with him to kind of make sure that what we're doing internally within Registers of Scotland is fitting in with the, you know, other things that are going on. We've made use of the assessment process where the um, they can send in people to kind of go over your digital plans and make sure that you're working in accordance with best practice. We follow the standards in terms of the government digital standards and things like that. So we are absolutely not doing our own thing off in isolation. We are doing best practice and joining up with other parts of the Scottish Government where appropriate to share knowledge, share skills and share ideas about how to approach things. And some of our people offer their services as assessors out to other parts of the Scottish Government because I think we're recognised as doing some quite leading edge work and therefore there's a feeling that our people could offer something to other parts of the Scottish Government in terms of reviewing their programmes and providing advice on where they could improve how they approach digital projects. You're reckoning to be fully digital by 2020, but the other side of the coin is, what are you doing to make sure that your uh, customers are fully digital? Otherwise, it's not too effective. Oh, and, and I think, as Janet's already said, that's the interesting challenge. So we, when we ran the consultation about our proposed rollout of digital services for the customer-facing part, there was a lot of appetite from our customers to bring in digital securities and a kind of digital disposition service. We've rolled out the digital discharge. It's very successful, um, but we still don't have all of the lenders signed up to it. So the um, and lenders are gradually coming on board, but we obviously can't make lenders sign up to that process. They have to do some potentially large changes to some of their IT systems to fit in with the new system. Um, so that's happening. Um, I think when we started to talk to customers about the practical realities of what a digital security system would mean. They realised, as Janet said, that some of the ways of their working weren't going to quite fit with that. So we're exploring with them how we can build a system that suits us, that still supports them in doing their work, because it's clearly of no 
gain to us if we bring in a system that actually our customers can't use and just slows them down and slows the conveyancing process down. I think digital discharge has been an exemplar in terms of by working closely with our customers throughout, we've brought in something that allows them to work much faster than they used to work. Um, and we've factored in a way of how we deal with the lenders who aren't yet on the system so that our customers can still work faster even in those cases. But realistically, are, are you and the customers going to be ready by 2020? So I think the 2020 target really relates to two things. It relates to bringing in services for our customers where, no, we are not going to have fully brought in a digital security and a digital disposition service by 2020 because our customers are not ready to work in the fully digital way. We will have absolutely made advances in terms of some elements of them working digitally with us, but to be fully digital, I don't think we will have got there by 2020. The other half of our digital programme is the internal stuff, where the tools we provide our people internally to do parts of their job, um, we are constantly bringing in. So I can give you an example. So we used to have a very manual process when a paper application arrived with us, getting that process, that piece of paper onto our system, one of the internal tools we brought in just before Christmas was an automated way of doing that. So the paper comes in, goes through our scanners, the application is automatically created digitally on our record. That is a massive step forward for us internally in terms of not having people having to retype in information from bits of paper that are arriving in the post. Long-term goal definitely will be where there's no post coming into the building, solicitors are filling in everything at their end, pressing a button, and it automatically comes through to us. But there's some bigger challenges with that around digital signatures and things that need to be overcome before we could reach that point. Angela Constance. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to the panel. I'm one of these MSPs that's been in correspondence uh, with you uh, recently. Um, but my first question relates to the registration processing times. Um, now, there is a, a backlog of applications for registration, um, suggesting that despite reassurances that the Keeper uh, gave to the legal profession in June, the backlog is growing and not decreasing. So, you know, July, around 43,000 cases uh, missed at the end of the month, increasing to 45,000 in August, 46,000 in September last year, 47-odd thousand in October, 49,000 in November, and 51,000-odd uh, at the end of the year. And I wonder if you can explain why that is and uh, what you're doing to address it. Absolutely. So I think the first thing to say is, um, so I arrived last April, one of the things I picked up on very quickly was that we had some types of work where we weren't operating within our service standard. I think it's worth saying for the vast majority of what we deal with, we do operate within service standard. 91% of everything we deal with goes out within 20 working days. But we did absolutely have some certain types of cases, so first registrations and transfers apart, where we weren't hitting our service standard. Um, lots of conversations with myself and others on the registration staff to understand why we'd got there and that's certainly something I can explain how we'd come to have the problem. The next question was obviously what are we going to do to fix it. Um, the feeling was that we needed to do two things. We needed to stabilise and actually to stabilise it was going to get slightly worse before it started to get better. So I asked the registration staff to do me a forecast of at what point they thought they would stabilise. It is about now and we've now had two weeks of achieving stability. So I'm waiting to confirm that actually that the number and both but what I mean by stability is that the number of cases going out the door is greater than the number of cases coming in the door because quite clearly if you're achieving that your backlog will start to go away so we always knew it was going to take us six months to stabilize so the rate at which the arrear was growing slowing it down slowing it down until we could turn it round um, that's required um, different ways of working. It's required some innovation from the registration staff about how they deal with the complex casework. The other thing we were doing in parallel to that is we were trying to bring in the age because the biggest issue we were getting from 
solicitors calling us up was the cases that we'd had for more than two years. So we were saying, right, the priority is stabilise, but also get rid of all the 2016 cases. So we're putting an awful lot of effort into working through those oldest and therefore most the reason they were the oldest is because they were most complicated and so do you have so forgive me for interrupting but do you have a, a, a breakdown of cases that are woefully overdue you know in that uh, two-year bracket cases that are a year uh, overdue uh, and, and cases that are you know six months you know um, yeah, it's, it's something we review very regularly. So at the last look, we had uh, just over 4,000 cases left with us from that are t uh, two years old. Um, we are expecting to get rid of those in the next sort of couple of months. I think one of the things that's worth saying is that there are cases that are going to be very complicated and we will have to work with the submitting solicitor because actually what they've sent us doesn't allow us to complete the registration process straight off so one of the things we brought in as a policy change was to say well we've had a case for more than three months we won't reject it which we are entitled to do if the case has any flaws in it at all we're entitled to reject it under the 2012 legislation but we thought clearly that's not helpful so taking a policy change that says we won't reject staff unless it's got a fatal flaw we'll work with the submitting solicitor to try and get what we need in order to complete the registration process. Okay, so how long is it going to take you to clear the backlog? So with our current level of staffing to get everything back within service standard using our current approaches, it could take us up to another 18 months. But we are working on new innovation in terms of ways of working. So we might be able to do it in 12 months. If we choose to boost our staff, we could do it more quickly than that. I think the thing we're reflecting on is what the necessity is to clear the backlog. I mean, clearly it's not acceptable that we have a backlog of cases, but in terms of the practical difference it makes to people who have their properties, it doesn't cause them issues almost in almost every case it doesn't cause people issues that their case hasn't been registered from a legal standpoint we take their case on on the day we receive it and the application their registration is when it happens is backdated to that date we introduced an expedite process so anyone who is experiencing any difference difficulties can get their case accelerated so the legal profession are telling us that there's no great rush to clear the backlog provided we continue to not reject and we're provided we continue to have an expedite policy so those small number of cases that need accelerating can be accelerated actually okay, I'm, 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 can, can you move on so it's 18 then. months um what, what worst case scenario? Uh, forgive me, I'm just I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I've got a few other uh, issues I want to to, to raise. Um, you, you you spoke earlier about um, you know some of the issues that you'll be dealing around uh, with boundary disputes. I'm sure every MSP here over the years has has written to you in some uh, regard with this. But can I just what I want to focus on is, is some some processes. So the Register of Scotland regularly receives map updates from uh, Ordnance Survey. Um, is it the case that you're obliged to use the most up-to-date version of OS maps as the base map? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, therefore, would you proactively advise uh, landowners if there is a change to that base map? Uh, we wouldn't. Um, so our map-based maintenance people, when the map tile is updated, they look at any titles that sit on top of that map tile. And if they... So, I don't know, if the, there's a boundary shown on the map tile, and when the map tile is updated, the property boundary no longer sits on top of the map tile boundary, we would make that adjustment, because we would say, well, that's clearly where it's meant to be doesn't materially change anything for the property owner there's nothing to notify them about if there was something more significant we would correspond with the property owner if we felt that we couldn't make the change to reflect the base map that showed you know showed their property boundary in the in the correct place but we'd have to take those on a case by case basis we certainly don't routinely notify people when we're making minor adjustments okay but there is an assessment process uh, that you undertake every time the uh, base map 
is updated where you're evaluating whether or not that has an impact on title deeds. Uh, yeah, because our, we have a team of people, a small team, who are physically looking at that updated map tile and saying, what does that do to the properties that sit on top of it? Do they now all look slightly skew if relative to the underlying base map? And do we need to make that adjustment? Or actually, no, they don't, and therefore there's no adjustment to be made. I think the other thing I would say is Ordnance Survey send us 400 updated map tiles every week. We don't get to all 400 in the week, so sometimes we are running at a bit of a lag. And again, we would deal with those if it's brought to our attention that someone is trying to transact on a property that sits on top of one of those map tiles that hasn't yet been updated, and that would be where that map tile would go to the front of the queue. Mm -hmm. But again, very happy to kind yeah, of explore okay. that in more but, detail. I mean, can, can, can you see the problem that if, you know, the base map has been changed some years previously and then, you know, somebody goes to sell their house and they then discover that the title deeds in the base map is out of sync? That would be the point at which we would update the base map and if we hadn't reached that map tile that would be the point at which we would make that adjustment and it it should never make a material difference to where someone's boundary sits i mean the the deed that was used to register someone's property will just have described and the map was originally drawn would have described that you know the eastern boundary is against the fence line if the map tile updates and shows the fence line now is a little bit further over than where it was because of ordnance survey surveying techniques, it's still appropriate for us to align their property boundary to the, to the fence line. The only time we wouldn't do that is if the fence line in the new survey has moved by metres and metres and metres, and we would say, well, maybe this is a new fence, maybe something strange has happened here, and then we would need to make sure that we were accurately drawing the property boundary on top and not suddenly allocating people new land that wasn't theirs. Mm -hmm. OK, I'll, I'll probably come back to you, yeah, reflect on your evidence and, and come back to you about this. Um, can you confirm uh, whether or not um, Registrars of Scotland is subject to the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act? Oh, my goodness. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> we certainly meet it. I'm sure we're 50-50, but um, uh, I don't know whether you don't know. we're in the... Yeah. I'm saying I don't know. So, yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Right. Well, that's uh, a wee bit worrying. Uh, whether you whether you're subject to it or not, you don't know. Okay. Um, tell me about the diversity on your board then. You know, what size is your board? Uh, how many are men? How many are women? Uh, so my board has um, four non-executives directors. Uh, three are women. One is a man, and then the executive members. It's two women and two men. So we're as close to 50-50 as you can be. I suppose if we had one more male non-executive director, we'd be exactly 50-50. OK. And your risk and audit committee? So um, this is uh, three women and one man. OK. And just uh, as a matter of interest, your workforce overall? Uh, almost exactly 50-50. I think we have very slightly more men than women. Um, overall, but almost exactly 50-50, mm -hmm. and our gender pay gap is 98%. Right, okay. 98%? Do I mean... No. Uh, you mean the other talk, way around. Talk us, talk us yeah. through that. <laughs> talk us through that. Sorry, I've got that wrong. As in, there's very little, 2%. Yeah, 2%. <laughs> I think it'll be Sorry. the 2% yes. or 4%. It's, okay. it's in that boundary. Sorry, yes. women yes. earn 98% of what men earn. Exactly. <laughs> right, OK. Yeah. So I could hear the two accountants I <laughs> with a sharp intake of breath there. Yeah. Um, right, OK. And in terms of uh, diversity in a, in a broader sense, in terms of people with uh, you know, disabilities... Um, you know, in terms of people that are uh, younger, in terms of your, your overall workforce, in terms of people from a BME background? So it's information, Janet's yeah. just putting it out, we publish annually in our annual report. Um, we've recently, one of the things I asked for fairly shortly after I joined was a diversity update, and that was looking at the diversity of the organisation versus the diversity of the population in Scotland to try and understand were there any aspects where our workforce didn't match the population. I think one of the challenges we have, as I think a number of organisations have with that, is people's willingness to declare various diversity characteristics. So 
our big push has been to actually try and get accurate data around that to make mm -hmm. sure that we are pe helping people feel comfortable that declaring all those things that would allow us to do that analysis accurately and understand whether there's any issue. We have an inclusion network in the organisation that um, it's a grouping of staff have come together to champion inclusion <laughs> issues and um, we take input from them about things. We're setting up staff networks to champion various individual aspects of diversity. But it's not something I feel from the evidence I've seen that we have any particular issue on um, in terms of our overall stats. So, uh, so, so, so what, what are the numbers? I mean, around 20% of the population live with uh, a disability. In some parts of Scotland, the BME community is as much as 12%, uh, although on average it's about uh, 4%. Ours is seven and a half percent to declared disabled in our last year's annual report. So we've got we've got a, a fuller equality mainstreaming report, and similarly, only one and a half percent have declared themselves as being from ethnic minority backgrounds. Okay, and is that something you would like to improve? We would certainly like to improve the um, uh, the reporting on it. We're not sure that that is accurate. Of our our um, this is declared, and we know that not. We've actually done some work to improve our um, uh, retention of the statistics because, of course, we gather a lot of statistics when we're recruiting and then we don't keep that for good reasons unless we've uh, asked people, may we do that when you... Uh, so people think that they've declared already to the organisation, but actually we're not holding that information. So um, there is something around we would like to know um, the uh, position better and we'd certainly like it to be representative. Yeah, okay. So I've read a little bit about your um, appointment process in terms to uh, your uh, v v various boards um, and, you know, it, you know, it sounded fairly routine. I suppose I would be interested to know a little bit more about um, how you as an employer seek to reach out and tap into a, a wide range of talents that exists, particularly in groups that are underrepresented? So, um, with the most recent, uh, are you interested specifically in the board or generally in recruitment to the organisation? Well, both. Okay. Um, so, I'll start with the board and, and the uh, Audit and Risk Committee. So, we advertise widely in a variety of um, different media, so civil service appointments, uh, various public pieces of media. Um, we get a good um, number of people offer, uh, wishing to participate in the process. Um, we have representation from various different uh, parts of the UK. So our board come from not just uh, Scotland. We have people representing other parts of the UK and, and indeed Ireland, which is, I think, useful because we bring people with different experiences of working in different parts of the jurisdiction. Um, I don't really know what else to say in terms of how we reach out. I mean, we feel we advertise wild, widely and we feel we get a good number of people. The Civil Service Commission came in recently and looked at our recent NED recruitment process from the Audit and Risk Committee and were very satisfied that it had been done appropriately and met all the relevant requirements. Yeah, I mean, it all sounds very much... Um if you don't mind me saying, uh, by the book, but I'm very uh, conscious that, um, you know, for example, um, your advisory boards, um, non-executive members, you know, you're not you're not regulated by the code of practice for ministerial appointments to public boards, you know, and so you know I'm wondering, you know, therefore, where's the um, independent and external uh, scrutiny um, and support for finding different ways and better ways uh, to reach out to those that are perhaps, you know, uh, a little less uh, likely to be within the current civil servant loop? Well, I think, I mean, our existing board members are absolutely, uh, non-execs are absolutely not all ex-civil servants. Um, we have one of our non-execs is an artist, um, from Northern Ireland, so you know she brings a very different perspective to the board. She works with tech startups, so I mean we have. I feel we have got good representation on the board of people who come from different backgrounds and can give us good challenge and advice uh, on on the work that we're doing. I, I don't feel we have a board of people who all bring a similar 
view and therefore we're not getting the breadth of input. Mm -hmm. But then your statistics will show that you're not um, necessarily uh, representing Scotland and all its diversity in your broader workforce. So I suppose I'm pressing you, and, you know, what, what are you prepared to do that's a bit different as opposed to the same old, same old? So I feel quite strongly that the best way to get a diverse workforce is to show that you are an organisation that supports that workforce in terms of, you know, leading on thinking around things. So, um, for example, um, in terms of the LBGT community in uh, ROS, really making sure that we're understanding that what we need to do to support them, making sure we've got gender neutral toilets, making sure we've brought in a process for people who want to transition at work. And I think showing that as an employer, we are trying to do everything we can to be a supportive, inclusive environment is going to be the best way for if people are looking at options for where they might want to come and work, choosing to come and work with us because they feel we'll be an environment and a, an organisation that supports them in all their sort of diverse characteristics. Um, I don't. I personally don't think it's right to just sort of reach out and try and bring people in without providing the right environment to support them when they get here. And a uh, final question, um, convener, can you tell us um, how many young people under the age of 25 you employ and how many um, modern apprentices you support? Off the top of my head, I can't. We certainly have supported the modern apprentice programme. Janet's going to have a look and see if we've got it immediately to hand, but I could mm. come back to you on that. I think the, when we did our look at the diversity of the workforce in terms of the sort of spread of age bands across the organisation, we had a good spread in terms of young, medium and more <coughs> mature people. Um, and certainly modern apprentices have been a very successful thing for us in terms of people coming in, participating in that programme and then choosing to stay on and make a career within Register Scotland. But we'd be very happy to come back offline with the specific numbers on that. Yes, I can't directly answer that one, but I, I, I was noting that we had managed to, our uh, under 30s uh, back in 2014 was about 7% of the uh, of the whole workforce, so it was quite mm -hmm. stable. We'd had a lot of people with us for a long time. We're now up to 17% are under 30, mm -hmm. so that's improved. Um, and that's certainly, we, we brought in quite a lot of modern apprentices, about 50 over a period of years, and many of them are still with us, so they've become permanent members of staff. Okay. Thank you, convener. So, did I understand you correctly that the the balance on the boards as such is um, more female than male? Yes. And um, when it comes to asking employees about characteristics, they've been reluctant to provide you with that information. I think, as Janet says, people have felt that when they applied to join us, they provided that information as part of the application process, and they haven't realised that due to data protection, we don't transfer that information onto our systems, so they need to redeclare. Um, so we're just pushing for people to do that. And again, I think you need to create a, a positive virtuous circle around that. We need to explain to people, well, how are you using that information? What difference is it going to make if they're providing that information? What decisions are going to be made on it so that people feel it's worth providing the information because actually it informs good decisions in the organisation? But, but do people perhaps just feel it's private information they don't wish to share with their employer? Oh, I think potentially people absolutely do and therefore... It needs to be us as a leadership community in the organisation explaining why we need, why we want to know, not about individual people, but at an aggregate level, what percentage of people we have from different diverse backgrounds so that we can make sure that we are supporting them appropriately, that they've got a voice within the organisation to raise any concerns. Right. I want to ask about more broadly, um, just in terms of staffing and... I think over the past 10 years, your permanent staff that is civil servants employed by you has decreased. And I think it's dropped by something like roughly about 200, so from just under 1,300 to just over 1,100. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think in the same time period, if we look between the 2009-2010 figures, agency staff costs were it's roughly, if my calculations are correct, about 
So quite a small percentage of the revenue mm -hmm. that you uh, bring in. And 2017-2018, it's risen to uh, 15 and a half million pounds. So it's it's a, over 21% of your revenue. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that, I think you've given in some sort of explanation to a certain extent about BT that you've already mentioned, no longer uh, working uh, with you on things and doing that through agency or contractors instead. And I think also the number of contractors uh, as such has risen from, well, if we take the 2009-2010 figure of 31, it's risen to about 161 in the 2017-2018 figure. Now, I'm just wondering, uh, first of all, is that an efficient use of your budget to spend so much of the revenue on um, contractors and agency staff at the same time as reducing your own staff and employees? It's certainly something I keep a close eye on in terms of value for money. Um, it's partly the flexibility of um, where we're doing projects. So, for example, the developments on the digital side that we've been doing, where we don't see that as long term. We, we kind of um, we, we know that to run our systems um, on a um, long term basis, we'll need a certain size of digital skill in the organization but we've we've been investing beyond that and so we don't want those people um to be with us for the long term it is for two three years and um, and so that's where sometimes we've been using contractors uh, we've also been we were expecting um our, as our um automation of, of services that we were talking about to actually reduce the numbers of people we need to be doing some of our registration activity and some of that's going a bit more slowly as we were saying as the um uh, our users are not ready for for um going for more automated services quite as fast as we thought we would do. So some of our planning on that has meant that we've taken on people um, on, a, on a more temporary basis, we, on two, one and two year contracts where we um, don't see the need for them uh, longer term. I, I suppose it, it's partly where a lot of our income is reliant on the housing market, which of course runs um, to a cycle, very conscious of um, what our predecessors having to react to in 2008, um, having to draw down on reserves significantly when there was was a big fall in the, in the amount of registrations coming into us, and therefore having the flexibility at that point, there was very little flexibility in the, in the workforce and in our costs, and we've brought in more flexibility um, since then so that we can be a bit more responsive to um, f any potential future changes in the, um, in the housing market. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that to a certain extent, but it seems... Um you know, a huge percentage of the revenue if it's more than 21% going on um, agency staff costs. And at the same time as the employees that you yourselves have is reducing um, or has reduced over the same period. And going back to issues that were discussed by um, Angela Constance, for example, I mean, you can uh, know what terms and conditions your employees are employed on and take responsibility for them and how they're treated and thinking more broadly in terms of you know, fair work for all of your employees. Whereas with uh, contractors or agency staffing, you don't have any say in that, do you? Well, well, we do treat our contractors as if they were permanent staff and for, for most of our terms and conditions in, in well, um, not in terms of the um, uh, flexi time that we offer and so on, and, and they're looking after their own pensions and so on potentially, but um, in, in terms of how they're treated on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we would treat them um, as fairly as we, as we possibly could. We wouldn't be treating them differently there. I'm not sure I understand that because, of course, obviously we treat them that way when they're working, but your point in having them is that you can get rid of them whenever you wish to is that not the point mm -hmm. and and we've we've found it, it back to the um kind of uh, digital skills we need and the data skills we need for the future and um, we we have found we can't we can't always recruit um into our own uh, in, into permanent staff so mm -hmm. we've needed to um source some of that from the market from contractors instead uh, but is this an efficient way to do it when such a large amount of your revenue goes on this 
uh, well, as I say, uh, we keep an eye on, uh, we try and make it as efficient as possible and, and as short term as possible that we're actually um, uh, using those skills for um, project work that has a finite end. Um, and we're also, uh, um, as I was mentioning earlier, we're, we're trying to use those skills as well to grow our own, to, to, to avoid it being an ongoing uh, basis. So we've brought in, for example, some developers from Code Clan who've been able to be trained up by the more senior developers who were getting on a more contract basis and, and, and bring them in for, for a longer term, more sustainable um, setup. So longer term, would you expect to see the agency's staffing costs decrease as a percentage of revenues? Yes. Um, and when will that happen? Well, we're, um, we've still got significant um, digital work we can see for, for the foreseeable 18 months or so. Um, beyond that, we think we could uh, have many of our... Uh, we, we could probably... Uh, reduce our digital needs, digital skill needs significantly beyond that. Um, I'll turn to Gordon MacDonald now. Thanks very much, Convener. Just to continue looking at the uh, financial numbers, over the last five financial years, the organisation has made a net profit on three occasions and a net loss in two, the last two years. Um, ranging from 10.9 million in 2013-14 to 15.6 million of a loss in 2017-18. Uh, what are the main factors, given that your revenue increased by 10 million pounds over that same period? What are the main factors for this large variance? So, so the um, cost of um, our contractors has been a, a major um, cost over the last two years, and um, uh, and that has been partly the the quantity of work we've been doing in that digital space. So we were talking about the discharge service, developing that, and developing Scotless, and so on. Um, the uh, we we've also um, we've also increased the amount we're, we're investing in some of our resilience of our systems. Uh, we have, um, we found that we are, we weren't quite as resilient as we thought we were when there was a power outage in to our Edinburgh office. We've invested in a data centre at Sockton House uh, um, so that we've got full, full, full failover now between the two centres. So we've invested quite a lot in that period around um, just making sure that our the integrity of our data is, um, is absolutely at the forefront. And um, we've, uh, we had, we've invested in, um, uh, uh, some power support so that actually there's been four power outages in the last year that we have our, our customers wouldn't have even noticed that um, that has worked so those kinds of things have drawn down on our we've drawn down on our reserves for that we've um, drawn down on our reserves similarly um, for that kind of refresh of our workforce we, we had a voluntary exit scheme which was um, a large chunk of um, 6.1 million we spent on that in last financial year um, and that uh, allowed us that bringing in some some younger um, some some new skills and and allowing some of our staff who um, uh, had perhaps for some people it was a big change from the 79 legislation to the 2012 legislation and changes in processes and so on so um, allowing some of those staff who were finding the changes more difficult and um, some of them opted to go and um, so, we, so we offered that voluntary exit scheme and that has helped us move on to being able to um, uh, uh, have the skills we need for the future. I mean, looking at your accounts, I mean, it shows that um, the staff costs, including the restructuring costs you're talking about, uh, increased from 50 million to 64 million. And the surprising thing for me is that your uh, voluntary exit scheme had 136 people on it, yeah. and your agency staff went up to 160, uh -huh. increased by 160. So, um, you know, you're, you're actually replacing the people I've left with agency staff, which suggests to me that you actually needed them. Um, 
Well, we, we, we um, still believe that that voluntary exit scheme will pay for itself within a matter of about 18 months. Um, what's, what's happened is um, we've, uh, with some of the changes to our processes, we're actually needing staff at a different grade for, for the processes. So, so we've done some backfilling, there's no question. So in absolute numbers, it, it hasn't fallen by 136, mm -hmm. but we've backfilled with different, different skills and at different grades. Okay. In terms of the, the corporate plan looking forward to 2018 to 2021, the suggestion is that uh, you will make a loss this year of 3.7 million, uh, a profit in 1920 of 3.5 and 2021 of 4.1. What are the factors that are going to change that position where you've made a, you're intending to make a loss this year and you made a loss the two previous years and yet in another year's time, you expect that to flip over to be a profit. Mm. So partly it's around um, what we, uh, what investments we make now um, um, for the future, and we expect and, and what happens to our income in terms of um, the housing market going forward. Mm. Um, as we're talking about the backlog of cases, so some of that um, we we have. If there were, uh, um, we, we do scenario planning around what, what if um, there was a significant crash in the market, what would, how would we respond? So we're ready for that. And um, we would, there would be a delay factor in terms of uh, work that we have with us that we would, we would complete. And, but we would, over a, a period of a few years, we would expect to be thinking about, um, actually, we might have the resource to do more on the voluntary registration side, um, more work with our data, perhaps, that we wouldn't have done. Um, so, we, so we would maybe need to be thinking about redeploying staff accordingly um, going forward. But you're yeah. confident you're going to hit these targets that you've set yourselves? We certainly, we'll, we'll rev we're revising those. Uh, as we speak, we're doing work around what, what does it look like going forward. We think we'll draw down a little bit more on our reserves than we had thought we would. Um, because we haven't got quite as many of the uh, cases out the door that we thought we would, so our income will be a bit less this year than we had forecast it would be. Um, but and, and and yeah, hence we're keeping an eye on that. Right. But looking at the reserves, um, over the last ten years, the reserves have dropped from 122 million in 2008-9 to 71 million in your last set of accounts. Um, what's the role of the um, board? in establishing what the reserves policy is? Mm -hmm. We review it with the board every six months, so we keep it under review, and um, we the, the, our reserves policy is, is a, a number of factors. We are very conscious of keeping reserves um, in line for, Partly what happens with the market, say there was a, a big drop in our income, uh, partly um, investment in, in land register completion and, and, and moving that, accelerating that. So work we do on keeper-induced registration, which doesn't bring a fee with it, you know, the balance of, of doing that. Um, we also obviously offer indemnity for customers. So if there's a, a problem that we, we will um, uh, follow up with our warranty, so we need to keep keep reserve to, to cover any unforeseen uh, amounts under that. Um, and, and also um, thinking very much about our workforce planning going forward and making sure that we've got the, get, got the right resources there. Yeah, given that your reserves have dropped 52 million pounds in 10 years and your current reserves are at 71 million pounds, what safeguards have you in place to ensure that the reserves are held that, that are appropriate to ensure that it's going to be a going concern going forward. If mm -hmm. you have so much fluctua fluctuation in both your income and your costs. Mm. Well, um, through the period uh, from 2008 to 2012, we drew down mm. 80 million of reserves. Mm. Um, so, so there's a there's a few factors in there. We we think we're compared to 2008. We've been doing a lot of in, um, investment in our in our processes and systems. We've had the new legislation that allows us to work more efficiently than we than we were able to under the 79 legislation. Um, we've we've increase the flexibility of our workforce. I realise that use of contractors is, is, um, uh, is part of that, uh, but actually that um, allows us to be much more flexible. 
Um, we've invested in our um, buildings. Our, our move in, in Glasgow from an old building on eight floors to one building um, on one floor, uh, we, we, lease, we lease a floor in, which has half the space, and that's saving us 400,000 a year um, to do that. So, so actually, we've, um, we're doing those kinds of investments, which um, should uh, see us in good stead. But we look at those alongside that reserves policy to just check that we are in a good place. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. And, and just kind of following on, I mean, the, the reserves then at around 70 million are roughly the same as your revenue. For, for, so that's 12 months revenue in reserve. Now, most organisations often kind of aim for about three months. And, and I take the point you're arguing that you're a bit more um, subject to volatility than other organisations. So is there a policy that the norm is to have one year's a revenue in reserve or six months or 18 months or have your policy in that area? We, we haven't uh, phrased it in that way um, but it, it but um, it partly depends where we are in the in the housing cycle perhaps that we would we would want to flex it accordingly so um, we, we need a bit more flexibility at this point uh, where the, the market ha looks as though it's slowing down a little bit um, and so we're, we're looking at that it also we need to see it alongside um, uh, how much work we have in that um, w with us so the backlog of cases um, is is linked to how much work we have that we would um, still we still have to work on and um, so so those things in fact so we haven't got a, a, a firm policy of 12 months and um, but it's something we keep under review depending on the other external factors okay I mean would an alternative model just be that the Scottish government fund you from year to year so that if you're planning over the next few years, a slight profit, a slight loss, then either they pay you some money or you pay it back to them and you wouldn't have to have reserves at all? Is, is that a potential model? It's a potential model. Our, our current model is um, is set out in the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland 2000 mm -hmm. Act. So, um, but obviously that could be changed. That was um, mm -hmm. the, but that's the where our um, current model of fees that we earn are retained for the purposes of the, of the keeper is, is set out. Mm -hmm. So, well, you're obviously going to work within the statutory uh, framework that you have, but you don't have a particular preference for what for that framework should be. You'll just live within whatever is there. Well, I, I suppose when that was, presumably when that was being passed in 2000, some of the thinking was around... Um, our, our income being that volatility around the income that Register of Scotland is perhaps a bit unusual in terms of other bodies that mm. our income might follow a housing cycle and so a, an annual budgeting is, is more challenging um, uh, uh, clearly it wouldn't be for us to, to um, no. make I mean, that it, stri it strikes me it's even more challenging if, you, if you're effectively standalone which I see you as being whereas if you were like a department of or, or our department, but I mean, if you were, um, if your finances were more in with the general finances, there'd be a bigger pool there that could absorb the ups and the downs. Um, but I, I accept that's not a question for yourselves; probably it's for uh, other people. I mean, again, longer term, just trying to tease this out a little bit more. Um, I mean, I, I realise you're going through quite a lot of change and in investment at the moment. Is there a kind of longer term plan that it will all settle down, and? Um, or, or is the main factor still that because the property market is so unpredictable, you're always going to have to keep sizable reserves and have that degree of uncertainty? Mm. No, I, I mean, we are becoming much more efficient in terms of our ongoing running costs, with, and that's what some of the investment has been. I suppose there would then be choices about whether we um, offer additional services we've taken on uh, additional registers over the last few years and and we've um we do work for revenue scotland and so on so there would be whether whether as we become more efficient we take on more services or 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 shrink the organization it would be a, a matter for i mean reducing your discussion. fees would be one suggestion i think mr mm -hmm. whiteman was hinting at that as well 
uh, there's not a decision being made on that then? or Our fees have been the same since 2011, uh, um, uh, apart from um, uh, the discount for voluntary registrations and the, um, and the discount, and I guess the discount for digital registrations is um, becoming more important in, in terms of how many people are um, gaining from that. So, so in real terms, obviously our fees have been reducing, but we haven't, um, but we haven't reduced them uh, in absolute terms. Mm. So, and how would that work in practice, you know, if, if these decisions have to be made that, you know, either you do more and do more registers, I mean, is that just purely the government would tell you that, or would you be involved in that kind of discussion, or has that discussion started or happened or anything? Mm -hmm. There's, we, we'd, be in, we'd be involved in that discussion, I guess, under land reform uh, options, we're in discussion around new register there. Okay, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. um, just to follow up on the on the staffing matter, would it be possible to provide a table with the um, the the civil servant staffing costs, the overall cost for the same period the agency staff costs have been provided uh, as mm -hmm. a follow up? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Um, now, Andy Whiteman wanted to come back, and then Dean Lockhart. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Just a few <clears throat> other follow-up questions. I want to revisit the question of accountability for the record to get this clear. So, prior to devolution, the Keeper uh, and your staff were accountable to ministers who were accountable to Parliament. Now the situation is that the Keeper is accountable to Parliament for Registers of Scotland operations, and that Scottish ministers are accountable to Parliament for policy decisions. That's your understanding, is it? That is my understanding. That, okay. yeah. So, where does that take us? in terms of the accountability for things like the failure to meet a 2019 target, the failure to deliver what was promised in the Scotless project. Who's actually accountable to that? Should I be asking Derek Mackay to account for that? Because those are solely policy decisions? Or is it a mixed accountability? Because I take it from, you're saying you're doing everything you can to do your bit to deliver those things, and I have no reason to doubt you are. So is it the Derek Mackay I should be holding accountable for those policy decisions and their wisdom or otherwise? So I think for the land register completion piece, there's a variety of people who are accountable <coughs> in terms of you know public bodies who are all, and, and private organisations who need to participate in that. Um, so I think you'd need to follow up in terms of yeah, how was the original target set and what were the expectations at the time about the risk, I suppose, with meeting that target. Yeah, you're right, we're doing everything we can to fulfil our part of the bargain. I think on Scotless it's a little bit different in that, as Janet said, um, an aspiration for what Scotless could be was set out. We were invited to deliver that system We've always wanted to be very customer-led in terms of making sure that what we deliver actually evolves as customers tell us what's useful to them. So I think it's we have shifted some of our priorities on Scotless, and I'm fully accountable for that. Um, and therefore, you should be holding me to account to compare with what was asked for with what's now in place. But I would stand by the view that what we've delivered so far has responded to what customers are telling us they actually want as we put something out there and ask them, does this meet your needs? What else would you like? OK, just moving on to three other little little questions. Um, in the, the forestry bill that Parliament passed last year, there was a an amendment seven in my name that came section 14 of the bill that required ministers to, in such manners they consider appropriate, publish information on forest holdings in Scotland, including their area and proprietorship. Um, the night before the stage three debate, um, Janet Egdell, you wrote a letter to the minister that was circulated to MSPs saying that this amendment would cost £600,000. It's not normal to have letters circulated to MSPs from civil servants. Um, the night before a stage three debate. Can you explain the circumstances in which you were invited to provide that advice to ministers? Um, we were, uh, I w was um, having a discussion with ministers about what the cost might be around it and, um, and asked to provide that. Um, that was, um, so that's our cost of, of providing that level of information on our okay. standard costs. So do you have it on the record exactly what you were asked to provide to, to Mr Ewing? You will it, have an email or a letter. 
it was a telephone call, I think, discussion we had. Could you make available to the committee whatever remit you were given? Because I'm just interested to know. This is it's not clear what, in response to what this letter was provided. Mm -hmm. So I think I was being asked what would be the cost if we were to provide on our standard terms that level of information. Okay. And, and that's what if I that's did. That's that. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, thirdly, we did a, an inquiry into Scottish data, um, economic data, uh, 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 last year, and um, we uh, we noted, for example, that the um, the uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission were paying you um, for data uh, in order to, um, I think it was, come to a view on their forecasts for land and building transaction tax uh, revenues going forward. Their job is obviously to forecast. Uh, and we wondered at the time why one public body was having to pay another public body. Um, the government responded to our, our report uh, and said that um, this was all being provided in accordance um, with information sharing agreement, um, that the cost was quite modest, in fact, £23,000. Uh, um, that's just sort of one example, and of course the cost is quite modest, but do you see a case for the public sector sharing this kind of information that it requires to do its job um, basically at no cost? It seems ridiculous that there are transaction costs involved when one public body needs information from another one. Well, I think from our point of view, with our current funding arrangements, it costs us money, time, staff effort to produce and provide that information. We need to operate on a basis where we recover our costs. And as we don't receive money from other sources, it's not viable for us to do that for free because there is a cost to us at the moment. OK, that's fair enough. And just finally, um, the Inspire Directive... Um, EU directive, which I think we recently considered a, uh, a Brexit SI um, on, is an EU directive to make geospatial information uh, available. This was implemented by Registered Scotland in November 2017, I think three days after the deadline. It had been implemented by the UK Land Registry in 2014, three years earlier. Is there a reason why it was so delayed? That um, may be due to our... Um our digital systems and and the investment in the in our de getting our data out. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I can answer for HMLR, but certainly we uh, are still reliant on a uh, 1996 um, uh, digital mapping uh, tool that we're using. And so actually, um, it's it's quite a job of work for us to put that onto a better basis as part of the investment we're doing at the moment. And um, hence, uh, we need. To those digital skills to do it, um, so it was probably it was probably the difference between our basing base systems. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Just just to clarify, the letter to which Mr. Whiteman referred about the six hundred thousand pound cost, you were asked by the minister to provide the information. You did so by letter, but it wasn't you that circulated the letter. No. no. Right. Thank you, uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Convener. A follow-up question on retained uh, profits, as, as set out in your uh, financial statements. When we refer to uh, retained profits, are we talking about an accounting entry, or is this real money sitting in a bank account someplace? It's close to what's in a bank account, but it's, uh, but there are some accounting differences between what's the retained profit and Right. And how is that money invested? Because I noticed that interest received has fallen from around six million about ten years ago to sixty four thousand last year so how how is that money invested and um, through the uh, we, we keep some in uh, available bank account with through Scottish um, public sector banking arrangements normal banking arrangements and um, uh, enough to cover our ongoing costs and the longer term any, any that we don't need for, for um, the shorter term we uh, invest in the national loan fund right and who sets the investment guidelines? Are these public sector uh, investment guidelines you follow? Yeah, we follow the, follow the Scottish Public Finance Manual. Okay. I'm just curious, the, the investment or interest uh, received last year of 64,000, if your retained profits are 70 million, that's a, quite a, a low yield you're getting on your investments. It's about 
0.01%, mm. which even if it's held in a bank account is, is quite low. Is there a particular reason why the yield is so low? So I think the piggy, figure you're picking up there is a net um, interest. Uh, right. So we, we actually also have a, um, uh, we, we have a loan that we was taken out on behalf of Registers of Scotland at the time when the trading fund was being set up in 96, um, that is, we are still paying interest on that loan. It was a 40-year loan. Um, so there's some interest out as well as interest in. Um, so that's, we're, 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 getting, we're getting standard national loan fund rates for um, whatever term, two to six months, we've, we've got um, amounts invested in. Okay. So that's a net number, I see. So what size is the loan that you have taken out? For? How, how, what's that? What's it's size? now two million. Two million. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you be able to provide those numbers? Because um, in terms of net interest paid out and net interest coming in, okay. because if, if, the, if the loan is two million mm -hmm. and that's offsetting interest received on 70 million, that might seem to be a, a bit of a mismatch there, and just in terms of the yield you're getting. Yeah, yeah. We've certainly looked before at whether we, um, whether it's value for money to um, uh, pay off the loan early, mm. and um, it, it's very evenly balanced um, because uh, we would pay the future interest more or less rolled up. Um, so it would maybe cost us three million to pay off the two million early. Um, right. So, so we've compa we absolutely can provide you with the figures, and we have have looked at that and keep an eye on that as to whether that would be value for money to pay it off early. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that um, concludes questions from committee members. So, thank you very much for coming in. I will uh, suspend this session and move into private meeting. <laughs>